humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill. I'm not exactly sure what to uh, what to call the thing that I want to talk about today. It's a it's a D and D thing. Something something cultural interactions. I don't know. We'll work it out as we go. Basically, within D and D, and of course a lot of other tabletop RPGs, there are some things that we kind of take for granted mechanically. Is that how I'm putting this? Things like character classes that we really think about in terms of their mechanical use within the story rather than their internal thingamaloo. You know, I feel like it's a thing that comes up from time to time where DMs will talk about Jim Bob doesn't think of himself as a fifth level rogue, he thinks of himself as a thief, which is True, it's, it's solid advice worthwhile thinking about, either in terms of roleplay or in terms of running a, a world that feels in some capacity real. But what I've been thinking about is, um, is how these things can be real within a game setting. There's kind of this untapped potential for story, for world building. Classes, which we usually deliberately separate from the narrative as like a as a, as a mechanical label, a design label, part of the, the meta game. What if we pull them on into the narrative and start looking at how uh, the culture of your setting might react to different character classes? My favorite go-to example for this, uh, in my setting, I talk about the difference between wizards and sorcerers and warlocks. There's, there's a, a trio of sort of related but distinct character classes, right? So now for my setting, I started from a place of thinking, well, what are the things that I like about um, the, the tropes of wizards, for example, that I like, that I want to keep a hold of? I kind of like the idea of wizards' towers. I have a whole backlog of much more complicated thoughts on wizards' towers that I won't get into here, I guess. But I do ultimately like the idea that wizards have towers. I like the sort of Gandalfian, uh, grey stranger, Odin wandering in disguise vibe of wizards that you sometimes see in fantasy, where they're sort of transient helpers who just show up in town from time to time. Everyone kind of knows them, but they don't stay too long. I like the idea that there aren't that many wizards, that they aren't very common, that they're very old and scholarly. These are all ideas that I liked, and I started to put them together and to think, well, why might it be this way? A wizard's tower, I decided to tie in with that idea of the wandering stranger. Maybe each wizard kind of has a, a broad reaching territory and that any settlements within that territory have a beacon that they can light and the, and the wizard's tower acts as kind of a reverse lighthouse. So a lighthouse as a tower serves to be like, here's a light that everyone around can see that warns that there is danger here where the tower is. A wizard's tower is kind of the reverse of that. It's, it's a tower that can see lots of other beacons. And if someone lights the beacon, the wizard knows knows that that town needs help. It's just a little idea I had that I thought was neat and I kept it. If I want there to not be that many wizards around, why might that be? Maybe a wizard only takes on one apprentice at any given time. Maybe you're not technically a, a fully fledged wizard master in terms of like level of skill. So like novice, initiate, apprentice, journeyman, expert, master. You're not a master wizard until I don't know, maybe maybe until you can cast ninth level spells, or maybe until your wizard mentor dies. Maybe wizards are old because it just takes that long to become a wizard, to learn everything you need to learn in order to properly be considered a wizard. It just takes you that much of your life. So then what are some follow through assumptions that come from that? It means that if you see someone who is young, who is a wizard, the immediate assumption is that they're new, they're, they're a bit inexperienced. Maybe they're still training. Maybe because they've spent so much time, they've dedicated so much of their life to learning how to safely use magic, maybe wizards have a great deal of respect from the broader community. In my setting, I've decided that means that there is a broader cultural expectation that most wizards can be trusted. All wizards are worthy of respect. Most wizards can be trusted. Because I've tied into that scholarship, right? That idea of um, safety. Contrast that with the second in line, the sorcerer. If we look at the ideas I wanted to keep there, I, I really, the big key thing for me, I think, is that I love that, um, that idea of like inherent inborn magic just by some fluke of the universe, the seventh son of a seventh son. There is an element of pure chance coming together that means that the sorcerer is wielding true 
raw magic. I talk about the sorcerer a lot in a video that is here and a big difference comes with that. If I say that the the scholarship and the long time learning that goes into wizardry is something that is is trusted by people, then by contrast someone like a sorcerer who's just been handed all of this power, who hasn't had to study, who hasn't had to learn ways to, to manage it safely. In my setting, sorcerers aren't trusted. If people find out that a sorcerer is staying in their tavern for the night, they're maybe not going to be too happy about it. Because in their eyes, a sorcerer could explode a fireball in the middle of the mess hall without meaning to. They don't have the training that wizards have. But there's not necessarily a, a huge, stark, visible difference between a sorcerer and a wizard, so then you get complications, right? Maybe, maybe people associate wizards with old age, with familiars. And so then any young spellcaster, or a caster who doesn't have a familiar, random normal citizens are maybe going to be mistrustful of that person. Even if it is a wizard, be because they're young, by virtue of their youth, people kind of assume they might be a sorcerer. And that's something to watch out for much more carefully. And of course, warlocks! Warlocks for me sit in a place where, again compared to wizardry, these are like the, the kids who flunked out. If there are so few wizards, if they only take on one apprentice at a time, which in my head comes in the form of like, you either have to go and petition the wizard that you want to train you, or maybe your parents apprentice you to just whoever the nearest wizard is when you're when you're a child. You know, there's this whole sort of formal process there. I didn't want it to be a school, I didn't want it to be like a, a magical academy, because for me that, that um, puts sort of a, a mass learning of magic into place that, uh, that didn't quite mesh with my idea of wizardry. Warlocks get to slot in in this place where maybe they were apprenticed to a wizard, but they didn't want to waste their entire life learning it this way, the, the longest way possible. So they took a shortcut. Or maybe they weren't accepted as a wizard's apprentice. This was their only path into magic. But for whatever reason, warlocks kind of sit in this, this place of much more duplicity than a sorcerer does. And there's maybe not quite the same stigma of, you know, the, the raw magic of a sorcerer, because at least a warlock is, you know, it's like they're getting oversight. The tricky thing with a warlock is that they're getting their power from an external source. Typically, in my mind, a being that, uh, while not a god, kind of works on that scale. Of course, that for me is because in my setting, the gods are not necessarily real. There's another thing, clerics. In my setting, I can think about the, the specific position that clerics hold within society. They are devoted to a god that doesn't necessarily exist. So I'm encouraging you to just think about how how these classes can fit into the culture of your setting. How might the culture of your setting react to the different classes in your party? For me, I found it helpful to kind of group my classes into trios. For me, those trios were uh, wizard, warlock, sorcerer. That's, you know, all dealing with magic. Ranger, druid, barbarian. Because in that trio, you've got kind of this, um, this scale of like relationship with the wilds and with civilization. So you have a ranger who tries to bring civilization and place it over top of the wilds. They try to tame the wilds. They, you know, a beast master ranger literally tames a wild beast. They are mastering the wilderness and bringing a civilization to it. Barbarians are the opposite. Barbarians are bringing the wild into civilization with them. You know, a town has its laws. A, a town might say, theft is illegal, you can't kill people, but a barbarian walks into town, you have no guarantee that that barbarian is going to abide by the laws of that town. Druids have this relationship with the wilds where there is a kind of order within the wild itself, and it's just something that we need to butt out of and stop interfering with. Paladin, cleric, monk, bard, rogue, fighter, but, but the point is, like, these are all just my musings for my own setting, the things I want to take from each of those classes and make a part of my world and then extrapolating and thinking about how they relate to one another and how they relate to the wider world. The reason I think this is worthwhile is that it creates um, a lot of interesting ways for different characters to engage with the setting. So let's go, go back to my wizard example, right? Now I said that wizards are typically very old because it takes so long to learn to be a wizard. And you might be sitting there thinking, but Dale, what if the player wants to play a young wizard? You've just kneecapped them. They can't do what they, they can't live their fantasy dream. I did not say that. Stop, communicate with your players. 
or me, because I mean, this isn't your setting, this is my setting. Me, com communicate with my players. Maybe the player character has been learning all their life and they're now, they're, they're out of the tower, but they're still not a master wizard because they need to go out and collect enough spells and learn enough spells that they can reach that elusive ninth level spell that I was talking about. Or maybe your mentor wants you to go out into the world and get some practical field experience. Maybe, maybe the wizard's mentor has died prematurely and now in order to finish their training, the, they have to summon their mentor's spirit as a familiar to guide them and the mentor just is not happy about it at all. By engaging with all this stuff that you've set up, you can end up with all kinds of really juicy background fodder for these characters. And then of course there's the way that, that NPCs are going to be engaging with different character classes because of the, the beliefs of these different places. You know, maybe a town that's closest wizard is an evil wizard prince named Omadon. Maybe that town isn't gonna like wizards so much. So maybe this character who's been so used to being treated really, really well actually is gonna come across a town that is pretty mistrustful of them, particularly if they're young. Maybe they think that this young wizard is the apprentice of evil uh, wizard prince Omadon. These are just my particular thoughts on different classes and how they might fit in, slot into the world around them. You're probably gonna have your own ideas. The point of all this is just to get you to think about those ideas and then figure out how you can you can squeeze these typically mechanical elements and, and get all the narrative juice out of them. Turn them into primo world building material. That's it for today. I hope that you enjoyed it, got some inspiration started. Maybe, maybe the gears are turning in your brain. What else is there? Um, the, the coding videos with my Uncle Graham have been going well. We started actually talking about the, uh, the guts, the, the inner workings of the game itself and what the game will look like. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out. Apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandma and I'll see you some other time. No, no, you know what? I'm not done. Go and watch the last video I made where I was baking. It's a good video. I worked hard on it and you'll probably enjoy it. All right, go watch the video.